Today we're talking about the geriatric and hospice care, supporting the aged and dying patient. So the definition of geriatric is um, that it's a branch of medicine dealing with problems and diseases of old age. The definition of hospice care is a facility or program designed to provide a caring environment for the terminally ill. Uh, there's um, something we need to talk about is in terms of preventive care, which we've talked about in Chapter 8, um, but we can really uh, make uh, geriatric issues uh, much better if we're using a lot of preventive care. So jumping in and, uh, and making sure they're vaccinated, their teeth are healthy, their, their mouths are healthy, will help to eliminate some of these issues uh, that we see later in life um, and also make them more comfortable as they age. How old is old? Cats, uh, they become seniors at about 11 to 14 years and geriatric at 15 years and older. Because dogs range in sizes, there are some differences in the way that they age. Uh, for medium to small dogs, they are considered seniors at 9 to 12 years and geriatric at 12 years and older. But for larger giant dogs, they're considered seniors at 6 to 9 years and then geriatric at 9 years and older. The premises of geriatric care. Premise 1, there are fundamental differences, differences in specific diseases, behavior traits, and nutritional needs of the older animal. Premise number two is that prevention, early detection, and timely intervention can have a significant impact on the lifespan and quality of life of an older dog or cat. So just like what we see puppies and kittens a little bit more frequently as they're developing and growing, we want to see geriatric older and geriatric pets a little bit more frequently as they age. Integrating geriatric care starts with owner education. We need to educate our owners why and how it's important uh, to um, begin uh, to uh, talk about disease prevention strategies and to start looking for these things earlier. So early detection starts at seven years. And we want to start doing physical exams at least twice a year. That would be a minimum. Um, doing diagnostic screening during these exams, doing blood work and urinalysis as a regular thing. And then if we have a chronic illness, we want to see them more frequently. We're going to talk about some common problems with aging pets. Some common conditions with any aging pets would be oral health abnormalities, specifically if we have not been taking care of the, the teeth and the mouth um, early on in their lives. Vision loss, hearing loss, cardiac disease, respiratory disease, neoplasia, which is cancer, kidney disease, urinary and fecal incontinence, dermatologic disease, orthopedic disease, and some other metabolic conditions. A lot of these things can be prevented in early in life. Uh, some of these things cannot. It's just a normal aging process. But what I will say, and I'll say this over and over again, is that age is not a disease. Uh, age, uh, an older animal can be perfectly healthy and then get a disease and we can fix the disease and they can be perfectly healthy. So I don't want to have you get in the habit of saying, uh, oh, that's just an old pet. Um, th that's the way they act or that's going to happen because they're older. Well, there are certain things that aging can do, um, but a lot of times there are diseases that we can take care of. So I don't want you to think of age as the disease. A lot of times when we see any pet, but particularly in, in aging pets that have a variety of diseases or might have a variety of diseases, we'll see some vague symptoms. So inappetence, they're not eating as well, lethargy, and weight loss. We need to start looking for the disease, not consider it a normal aging process. Some annual tests you want to do are a blood count, so looking at their red blood cells and their white blood cells, a chemistry screen, which will tell us what their organs are doing, a urinalysis, which will uh, tell us what's going on within their urine, urinary tract, but also when we compare it with a chemistry screen, we can see what's coming in, what's going out, um, and get a, a broader picture of what's happening in the body. A chest radiograph will tell us what's happening within the uh, lungs and the heart, and then blood pressure. Some common problems, oral health problems. Complaints uh, will be halitosis or bad breath, 
difficulty chewing, holding food, food in the mouth, excessive salivation, so they're drooling a lot. And that usually indicates pain. It also can indicate nausea. Cardiac disease, some complaints would be fatigue, exercise intolerance, collapse, or cough. For cats with cardiac disease, one of the complaints is actually vomiting. Respiratory disease, complaints would be coughing, exercise intolerance, breathing rate and effort are increased. Uh, neoplasia is cancer, and then kidney disease. Uh, for urinary, other urinary issues, uh, we might have a, uh, uh, incontinence or frequent UTIs, and then fecal incontinence. Neurologic abnormalities might see behavior or mentation changes, and then orthopedic diseases, osteoarthritis. Some common endocrine problems that we'll see in older animals. Hyperthyroidism in cats typically happens with an older animal. Hypothyroidism in dogs actually usually happens in middle age to older animal. Diabetes mellitus can be middle aged to older. Hyperadrenocorticism is Cushing's disease, and that usually happens in an older animal. Some changing nutritional needs of aging pets. Uh, we do need to do a nutritional assessment, uh, much like we would do with any age pet. Um, go by their medical history, do a physical examination, and do lab work to see what, what is the best thing for them. Ideal nutritional regimen will be based on nutritional and caloric needs, which we've already talked about, and it accounts for individual health challenges. We have a lot of nutritional uh, veterinary diets that are available to pets at, at this point. Um, and so it makes it a little bit easier for us to make some good choices. Some hospice care um, ideals for cats and dogs. Um, typically, when we're talking about hospice care, hospice care, we're talking about palliative care. Palliative care means making them feel better uh, for the short term or the long term. So it usually starts with some pain medications. We want to assess the pain, monitor the pain pretty closely, um, and then look at the the different drug classes. When we talk about pain relief uh, in humans or pets, it's really important to do a multimodal uh, approach, which means we're using a number of different um, items in order to promote a, a lower um, um, drug dosages so that we can do it for a longer period of time. So we'll use non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. These are NSAIDs. When you think of NSAIDs in humans, the one common drug that you might think of is ibuprofen. Ibuprofen is an NSAID that's commonly used for anti-inflammation and it's not a steroid. We might choose to use a steroid although they have multiple side effects that we do need to be careful of. Opiates are commonly used. They're great for pain relief, uh, but we do need to be careful when we use them. Uh, and then nutraceuticals. There are lots of nutritional um, uh, nutrients that are available to our uh, pets, um, just like they're available to us, that can actually make them feel better. Glucosamine and chondroitin sulfate may be something that you have heard of before. Uh, it's usually used for osteoarthritis. Omega-3 fatty acids. Uh, are often used for uh, neurologic disease, uh, skin disease, um, osteoarthritis as well. Nursing care for the hospice patient, we're going to talk about how do you care for a recumbent patient. A patient that is recumbent means one that cannot get up. And one of the common problems that we see with them are that they will get decubital ulcers. These are ulcers because they've got uh, pressure sores uh, from being on their sh uh, sharp uh, joints like elbow shoulders, the tarsi, tarsi, which are the um, uh, lower, the hawk joints, um, the like ankle joints, hips, anything that is pointy that doesn't have a lot of cushion between the bone and the floor um, will have uh, decreased blood flow to that area. Decreased blood flow will kill the tissue around that and the tissue will fall off and that becomes an ulcer. So we want to give them a nice padded area um, to lay on. We want to turn them every couple of hours. Uh, those are our preventive measures and then we may have to treat decubital ulcers if we don't get them before they become a problem. 
Subcutaneous fluids, this is something that are commonly done with um, older animals that are either able not to get up and drink um, or have a disease that causes them to lose fluid more rapidly than they can concentrate it, like kidney disease. So it's relatively easy to teach owners to treat their pets with subcutaneous fluids. That's just putting fluids under the skin. Bladder expression, we may have an animal that is unable to express their bladder, so we can actually do it for them or or uh, teach owners to do that for them. Uh, we do have to be careful when we're doing bladder expression not to uh, burst the bladder, so we have to do it slowly um, and uh, use caution when we do it. Um, if the animal has a incontinence, we have to be careful with urine scalding. The urine, uh, as it comes out and sits on the skin over time, because of the chemicals that are within the urine and the pH of the urine, um, can uh, damage the skin. And so if we have leakage of urine, we want to make sure that that's kept clean and dry as much as possible. We might have to use appetite stimulants. Um, usually if we're if an animal is not easy, eating, we want to find the cause of that before we treat it. So we want to see if we can get them to eat on their own just by fixing whatever's causing them not to want to eat, whether it's kidney disease, liver disease, something like that. Um, if it doesn't appear to be anything except the animal just doesn't have that urge to eat, we may uh, want to give it an appetite stimulant. Uh, animals that don't eat will decline very quickly. Uh, we may need to, until we have them feeling better, place a feeding tube um, to maintain their nutrition. Uh, if we have a short-term uh, issue that can be fixed with feeding, uh, which a lot of things can be fixed with nutrition, uh, then there are benefits to placing feeding tubes. But that's something we have to discuss with the owner. Uh, there are a lot of different types of feeding tubes. Uh, feeding tubes that simply go into the nose uh, and down through the uh, pharynx into the esophagus. Uh, there are feeding tubes that go into the esophagus itself. There are feeding tubes that go directly into the stomach and that need to be placed by a um, specialist uh, or into the ileum or jejunum or different part of the intestinal tract. Um, carts and slings. So if you have an animal that's having difficulty maintaining their ability to walk, um, there are certain slings that we can use that make it easier for a client to help their animal outside uh, to go to use the bathroom or uh, getting a cart, a specially made cart that will help the animal to move. Um, we may get to the point where the uh, it is un we are unable to provide a good quality of life for this animal, and at that point we need to discuss um, euthanasia. And it may be good to discuss that with the owner early on in the hospice care versus later on in the hospice care, so that they have certain expectations. When my pet can't do this, when my pet can't do this, so they have a way of objectively looking at the issue. Horses. Horses are considered geriatric at age 20 or older. I'm going to do a physical exam on them and look for weight changes, their hair coat, um, some other common problems. Our examination will include an equine body condition score. We're going to be looking at the amount of musculature along the spine, um, along the neck, um, and looking at their uh, overall body and muscle mass. Um, Looking at their attitude, is this horse bright, alert, or does it look depressed, standing in a stall looking at the side and not interested in uh, the person looking in the stall? Um, you can also see, and we'll show a picture of this later, but you can see that the, the um, be decreased in strength in this horse. The, the, um, the horse is unable to keep an upright posture of its uh, uh, legs. And fetlock. Um, also looking at the hair coat, uh, are they able to shed properly or are they, able, are they shedding too much? Do we have bald spots? Uh, what do we need to um, uh, see uh, in a good hair coat on this animal? Some common problems. Now we need to remember that horses teeth erupt from their gums continuously uh, throughout their lifespan. As they get older uh, they have less teeth um, available to erupt. Um, so they're, they, when they are adults, they have fully formed teeth in the bones of their skull. As the teeth erupt, they have less and less teeth below the gum line to erupt. 
um, over time this gets worn down because of the way they eat and grind their food and so eventually those teeth will be worn down to nothing. So we'll see what we consider a wave mouth where we're missing teeth or the teeth are ground down uh, unevenly um, and then also sinus infections as the teeth are uh, ground down to nothing or break open. Uh, we may get uh, infections to the root of the teeth that go up into the sinuses within the skull. So uh, uh, this is an example of an old horse missing teeth and some uneven wear of the teeth. Uh, vision, uh, equine recurrent uveitis is what ERU stands for. Um, that word is further up in your objective list, but equine recurrent uveitis is when we have uh, recurrent inflammation within the um, eyeball. Uh, and this can be a genetic condition or it can be after uh, a, uh, it can be an aging change where we see increased uh, white cells, uh, increased protein in the um, eye. And so it can cause some, we call it moon blindness, um, so it can cause some visual uh, deficits, especially at night, um, where there's too much protein in the eye causing cloudiness of the vision. Also cataracts are common in older animals as well. Cardiac disease can be an issue. Uh, we want to do a pulse and listen to them to, to listen for cardiac disease. Uh, a respiratory condition in older animals um, can be uh, middle-aged to older animals. There's one that's common called heaves or recurrent obstructive airway disease. It's very um, uh, very like chronic obstructive pulmonary disease in humans or COPD. And basically what it is is for whatever the cause, the uh, the lungs get very um, inflexible. They get scar tissue, and it's often caused by um, dust in the lungs, uh, uh, inflammatory response to chronic dust in the lungs, or an allergic response um, causing uh, scar tissue formation in the lungs. So the the lungs aren't as flexible, uh, which causes causes them to be unable to um, expire air as easily. So they'll be able to breathe in, but it's harder for them to push air out. So heaves is the common word for that. Also roads or recurrent obstructive airway disease. Gastrointestinal disease, looking at the manure, it should be well formed. Um, if it starts to get loose, we may have some changes in the in the uh, microbes or the bacteria that are in the intestinal tract and the bacteria in the intestinal tract of a um, animal that is eating primarily grass is extremely important. So we may have to give probiotics, vitamin B, some other things to help in um, the intest gastrointestinal tract work a little bit better. Kidney disease can be a common issue with horses, so doing a urinalysis uh, along with blood work would be helpful. They can get some skin disorders, um, neurologic abnormalities, and this, this is orthopedic disease where we have tendons that are just not as strong as they used to be. Cushing's disease is a very common chronic disease of the geriatric horse. It's also known as PPID, it's a pituitary disease that causes endocrine or metabolic disease. It causes an increase in corticosteroids or glucocorticoids, uh, cortisol or stress hormone. That's Those are um, all the same sort of word uh, for the same thing. But it increases this hormone, the stress hormone, and so we'll see symptoms um, associated with that where we have changes in hair coat. Um, it can look like hypothyroid uh, in, in horses. They tend to gain a lot of weight. They don't uh, have a normal hair coat, usually get a little... Um, they don't shed as well. Um, they uh, tend to have a lot of issues. Um, so basically, uh, we diagnose with a uh, blood test, and uh, we might have to do what's called a um, an ACTH stim test or or something that it stimulates the the um, adrenal gland. And we look at the result on multiple blood tests uh, to look at the result of what happens when we stimulate that gland. Um, 
medication. Uh, there are medications available to treat Cushing's, but a lot of the Cushing uh, treatment has to do with nutrition. Uh, and uh, with nutrition, we're, what we're actually doing is, is removing a lot of the carbohydrates, which are the uh, building blocks for some of these glucocorticoids. Um, so removing a lot of starchy, um, sugary foods and treating them with nutrition. So uh, heaves, recurrent airway obstruction can be acute or chronic. Um, we can do some testing to see what is causing it, but our treatment is to generally keep them out of dusty environments, uh, try to keep allergies low, uh, and there are medications that we can give them to open up the airways and to um, we can either give it to them by uh, injection um, a syrup uh, called clenbuterol, uh, which will help to open up the airways, uh, or um, nebulizing them, which is like you would if you had a, a breathing treatment uh, for asthma. It's the same thing. We're actually um, giving, putting something over their nose in order to have them breathe it in, breathe in some steroids basically to their lungs to open up the airways. Uh, laminitis or founder is very common. It's common in every age of horse and some uh, are more genetically predisposed to it than others. Founder happens uh, when we have, and we've discussed this before, but founder happens uh, when we have um, something that causes inflammation in the hoof. And so there are a number of different things that can cause this. Anything that can cause uh, inflammation or increase in white cells throughout the body can lead to founder. So overeat, anywhere from overeating to an injury uh, to something stressful to colic to Cushing's disease. Um, so we can see founder uh, pretty commonly with Cushing's disease. Um, treatment uh, includes limiting access to high sugar, high starch diets. Um, it includes um, anti-inflammatories, certain uh, shoes we can put them on, corrective shoeing uh, can be helpful as well. Dental problems and sinusitis, so an abnormal occlusion, their mouth not coming together properly, like that picture that I showed you. Uh, that wave mouth is the most severe abnormality. When animals can't bring their mouths together, um, and then they may break a uh, tooth. Um, you can get a sinusitis from that, from a tooth root abscessation, or we can get immunosuppression caused by the PPID, which is Cushing's disease. Stress hormone or in your system, it's going to cause immunosuppression. So if we don't have proper immunosuppression, obviously infections can take over. Equine recurrent uveitis, or ERU, is a progressive disease. It causes and degeneration in one or both eyes. And again, this can be genetic. We see this often in Rocky Mountain horses, uh, in almost every Rocky Mountain horse, or uh, it can be um, over time. Uh, some neurologic deficits, some uh, changes in their uh, nervous system, um, damage to it, or uh, due to an infection of some type, um, we can see some problems with that. And then musculoskeletal system, uh, degenerative joint disease. These are animals that sometimes have been used pretty, pretty hard, pretty heavily, jumping, running, racing, that kind of thing. Um, and so over time, that can be a problem. So using non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, um, like fer ferrocoxib is a, an example of that, uh, can help that. And also a lot of nutraceuticals are used for these guys. So management, nutrition, and nursing care of the geriatric horse. We do need to be careful with them. Um, give them um, padded stalls. Uh, make sure that they're um, kept, you know, in a in a cushy environment, a cushioned environment. Make sure their weight stays up. We may have to be very careful with the type of medication we give them. They may be more sensitive to it. Make sure that we give them regularly deworming um, or even better, remove manure uh, frequently and don't have them in um, areas where there's uh, they can reinfest themselves with parasites. Uh, in general, this is because most horses have a pretty good immune system. They can deal with a small amount of parasite load. Older horses have less of an immune system and a small amount of parasites will cause a problem. Um, 
we want to keep them in a, a smaller herd so we don't want them around a lot of uh, other animals um, keep them healthier regular vaccination is going to remain important uh, make sure we're monitoring them daily several times a day and feeding them appropriately as horses get older we may need to feed them a, a mash uh, instead of something that has a lot of hay uh, because they may not be able to grind it up with their teeth as much End of life issues with larger horses, of course, it becomes more of an issue. We want to watch body condition. Uh, if we have pain uh, called refractory pain that we cannot manage with um, common medications, they have severe uh, DJD or they're falling, that can be very dangerous for them and for you. Um, and we may think of this uh, going into a cold weather, into fall or um, uh, winter that we may not want them to go through another fall or winter because it's uh, they're getting older they're less uh, able to handle the colder weather if you have any questions about this um, uh, lecture please let me know uh, I'm sure they're you're gonna uh, remember some things about your own pets as they get older I can certainly discuss that